What's being uh, referenced with Wikistrat is the fact that we're an online wargaming company. We're a crowdsourced consulting company, uh, arguably the first in the world. And what we have is about 2,000 experts, people much like yourselves, spread all over the world. And we do simulations of future events, future trends unfolding and whatnot for a variety of private sector and public sector players with a certain concentration in the U.S. Uh, government and increasingly with foreign governments friendly to the United States. Um, I'm going to give you a presentation that basically explores some of the trends driving energy demand. And then I'm going to talk about how that, those trends and the developments in the energy sector are going to drive certain geopolitical challenges in the years ahead. I'm going to start off with a, a fairly US-centric argument about how America changed the world for the better. And this argument is based on the notion that it's all about rules in the international system. If we talk about an American system, I would shorthand it as states coming together. We forget we're a multinational union. Economies integrating over time, which is why technology like the fracking uh, revolution can spread so rapidly throughout our country, because we have very homogenized rule sets. Collective security, the encouragement of infrastructure, network transaction growth, and then the tough parts, a competitive religious landscape, which means people can change their religions in America without penalty, which is fairly unique in the world. Um, and Americans do tend to change their religions more frequently than any other society in the world. That yields a political pluralism in our system based around a unifying middle class ideology. The world likes the part of globalization that we seek to export on that top line there. The hard part comes primarily in the social and the political realms. And primarily it has to do with male control over female in traditional societies and the fact that globalization as propagated by the United States tends to empower women disproportionately to men because networks are gender neutral. And if you want to anger young men in traditional societies, come in and alter their definitions of wives, mothers, daughters, sons, family, and everything else because that's impactful. I'm going to argue the United States, as I said earlier, the first and most successful multinational union. We've been doing it for about 250 years. We are, in effect, globalization in miniature, an early version of globalization that we incubated for quite a period of time, about a century, and then began to export, specifically after the Second World War. That's when FDR had his notion of an international liberal trade order that would be propagated because of the Cold War that ensued, it could only be propagated in the West. It was enormously successful. Fragment of human population generating the bulk of global wealth through the early 1980s. That attracted the emulation of the East, most powerful figure second half of the 20th century, Deng Xiaoping, making the choice to embrace markets. That creates the movement, the concentration, the critical mass that we now describe as the global economy, or in the last 15, 20 years, we've been calling globalization. With really only about a bottom billion still disconnected from that package, mostly in the interior, Central Asia, interior of Africa. I will tell you that's been America's grand strategy going all the way back to it was given this name um, under um, Teddy Roosevelt. And coincidentally, in relation to the Chinese, which is interesting. Uh, but basically, it's been this notion of if you encourage free trade, good things follow. And when we've gone off the rails, as we have at various points throughout history, it's when we've gotten confused about the order, when we think it's all about creating democracy first and then the economic growth, when in truth, it's all about creating the economic growth and then comes the democracy. If we could talk about how the Europeans ran the world in the Great Divergence, as some economists dub it, basically looking at the West versus the rest under the two centuries dominated by colonialization. The West got very wealthy, the rest got ripped off. What happens under the US-led system? We see it flower in the 21st century. The West grows its usual 600% across the century. The rest double that. And economists start to call that the Great Convergence. And the real radicalizer here in terms of global energy is the creation of a global middle class, growing at roughly 70 million per year, which is a bit above ISIS and Al-Qaeda recruitment goals. 
So no question about who wins this struggle of civilizations as it's often dubbed. But we are talking now for the first time in history, the majority of humans can be logically described as middle class, not the middle class ideal from America in the 1950s and 60s, but a middle class that has disposable income. Typically a family of four with income in the range of about $10,000. And what do we know about the middle classes that emerges throughout history? They want unlimited education. They want unlimited mobility. They want unlimited electricity. So this is the big challenge of the 21st century. We create a global middle class, now how do we keep it happy? So what the middle class needs, summed it up previously, here are some of the numbers for the various parts of the world in terms of trillions of dollars. They want potable water. There's 23 trillion in investment over half a century or a quarter century. They want electricity. There's another nine trillion dollars of investment. And they want mobility, infrastructure, another 10 trillion. So about $40 trillion being spent in a fairly concentrated time frame. What that means for the planet is we do something very rapidly, and that is urbanize. About two, three years ago, we hit this point where we became half rural, half urban. How that translated in terms of a global population, a little over 7 billion a little bit more in the urban than in the rural, but it took us 4,000 years to get three and a half billion people in cities. What happens by 2050 is a radical jump. We keep that uh, ur rural population uh, depressed, we keep that urban population, and then we come close to doubling it very quickly. So 4,000 years to put about three billion people in cities, another 40 years to grab another three billion. That's roughly six Sao Paulo's every year for the next 36 years. The concentration will be in the interior of East Asia, China will be the big leader, and in the interior of Africa. And Chinese construction companies, due to economies of scale, will be the big leader there. So China and Africa are going to urbanize and grow up together, which creates a certain geopolitical dimension for the Africans, which is a strong Chinese investment and construction and resource presence. So what we're going to see are a lot of megacities sprouting out across humanity. I will tell you inside the Pentagon, one of the favorite memes right now is that urbanization itself is a threat. If you think about our video games and our fascination with zombies in popular culture nowadays, it seems that urbanization more and more is being cast as a, a threat to humanity itself. It's an ungovernable space because it's so dense it's so complex, it's so chaotic. I will tell you, urbanization throughout history tends to raise income. So as you increase the percentage of your urban population, per capita GDP grows. And this happens all over the world, throughout history. Very clear correlation. Why that matters is you get a population in that zone of about six to 10,000 per capita GDP, and they democratize. And we can track the various levels of success here. If you try to democratize a country like the Gaza Strip with a per capita income way below 3,000, what you get typically in free elections is Hamas. So below 3,000 per capita, it's about a one in 100 chance of successfully democratizing, going politically plural. You get a country to three to 6,000, the odds are roughly even. You get a country and economy above 6,000, it's about a 95% success rate. You get a successful democracy above 10,000 per capita GDP, and they become, in the words of my friend Fried Zakaria, basically immortal. One has never failed. So urbanization increases income, increases democratization, and that over time creates more democracies. So we got the blue line for democracies, we got the red line for dictatorships, and we got the black line for single party states. And what we've seen throughout the time period dominated by US hegemony, so-called, across the system is a huge increase in the number of democracies. And a huge decrease after peaking at the height of the Cold War of uh, dictatorships, and a move much more towards the mixed. 
And we've seen that even survive what was described as the worst global downturn economically since the Great Depression. You go back to 2008 when everything started to hit the fan and there were predictions of all sorts of right-wing turns. A rerun of the 1930s. Truth is, we added six democracies. So the system survived incredibly well. Why that matters, the development, the democratization, more political pluralisms, the grassroots environmentalism tends to create more care towards the environment. This is the Kuznets curve uh, applied to the environment. Basically per capita income, in terms of deterioration of the environmental system, you have a ramping up as you industrialize and then a peaking and then an improvement. Almost virtually any country you can look at in terms of a modern society, you can go back 50, 60 years, and that place is far more polluted than it is today. So the question isn't do you prevent development? The question is how quickly can you make this curve be surmounted? Now the trick here is what goes down there on the right tends to be air pollution. And what increases over time, which we haven't yet gotten a terribly good grip at, are CO2 emissions. So there's a shift in terms of the environmental burden. It goes from local, immediate, and health threats to global, long-term, and threats to ecosystems, like the acidification of the oceans. So that's the package that we've created, this global middle class and its demands for mobility, its demands for more food, its demands for more potable water, and its unlimited desire for electricity. So what does that do to the geopolitical landscape? I'm going to start with food. Because food is water basically turned into something far more transportable. It's lighter. We have basically four grains, three of which are dominated by the United States, that account for 65% of the calories consumed around the planet. Rice, corn, soybeans, I always forget the fourth one. Wheat. Thank you. I'm from Wisconsin, so it's corn. It's beer. Yeah. Straight to the beer. Oh, you're right. Wheat. I should pay more attention. Where you grow food in excess, meaning you can export it. Okay, so these are the supply centers in the system, or where you have more people, or fewer people, relative to freshwater resources. So breakdown, world population, percentage, world's fresh water. Europe, surprisingly not so good. Africa, surprisingly good. Problem is it only rains twice a year. Oceania, this is not Australia the west. This is more Australia the southeast, and particularly New Zealand, otherwise known as the Saudi Arabia of milk. And then here's the problem. Asia, 60% of the world's population living on far too little water. China itself sits on about 7% of the world's fresh water. And that economic development it's undergone over the last 25 years has stressed that ecosystem out dramatically. Here's the unknown, poorly understood advantage of the Western Hemisphere. We have roughly three times as much water as we need. And it tends to be concentrated more towards the south and more towards the north. So big surprise, where you have the excess water is where you can export grains. Million metric ton flows, there are only four places in the world that export grain. Australia, New Zealand, Black Sea region, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, and then the King Kong of the system, the United States and Canada, which dominate global grain trade like OPEC reserves dominate oil, or like the US South dominated cotton, 1860. About 70% of the movable feast comes out of North America. Everybody else imports. And you can see when China wants to increase its caloric intake, that drives rapid price increases for the most vulnerable, food-dependent part of the world, the Middle East. In Egypt, bread prices went up 100% in the 12 months leading up to the Arab Spring. Right out of your Victor Hugo, you raise the price of bread, people get upset. Now when you put climate change on top of that, there's good and bad news. Where it's good, it'll get even better on some level, and where it's bad, it's going to get dramatically worse. You go above 35 degrees, below 35 degrees, 
you're going to grow okay or better. That chunk in the middle is going to get dramatically worse. Turns out that's where 80% of your population growth is. That's where 80% roughly of your water shortages are. That's where overwhelmingly all the violence in the system currently exists. That's also the one place, the one band in the world where Islam tends to dominate. The good news on this is that climate change favors a lot of positive countries, I would argue, very established democracies. Climate change, there's not an argument to be had in terms of is it happening. You consult the plants, you consult the animals. They are moving towards the poles, they are moving up in elevation every year. So they don't care about our Fox versus CNN debate on the subject. They're just moving in response to environmental stimuli. That means the flow that keeps America young in terms of immigration is going to continue to happen from Central America and the North Andes portion of South America because life is going to get tougher there. They're going to come because it's going to be even more of a land of plenty. This is where we grow wheat now, North America. This is where we grow it in 2050. There is a book, um, The World in 2050. Great book on the subject, talks about the New North. An international organization, poorly understood, incredibly important for the future of the planet, the Arctic Council. Just paid attention to by the United States for the first time not that long ago, about five years ago, first time uh, Secretary of State ever went to one of the meetings, Hillary Clinton. Here are the eight current members. You look at that bunch, one, you say a lot of heavy drinkers. Two, you say, wonderful democracies, and Russia. This is the new north. Lots of arable land, lots of water, 25% of the world's hydrocarbons in the Arctic Circle. Now, the biggest globalizing player right now, biggest grower, China, does not have a seat. They are an observer member. They would love to have a seat. I note they recently built a ginormous embassy in Finland for no apparent reason other than it's a member. A Chinese businessman tried to buy about 5% of Iceland's land mass a couple years back, wanted to use it for a nature preserve. The Icelanders said no. You could always talk about China basically buying uh, Greenland from Denmark. It's only 50,000 people. How hard could it be? And they could always buy their way into the Russian seat which they're doing. They just plop down a huge amount in a hydrocarbon project inside the Arctic Circle. And before you say that's too crass of the Chinese, I'd like to point out America bought its way onto the council from the Russians, late 1860s, Alaska for $7 million, one of the best purchases ever made. Location, location, location. But there's your new north. So to the extent Climate change creates environmental refugees, fate of the planet concentrated in the hands of those who benefit from climate change. We're well positioned in terms of the countries that are going to have a say in this. Some of the most conscientious, most effective representational democracies, uh, democracies on the planet. Second point I made earlier about mobilization, you could basically track globalization spread from the European construct to the American emergence across the 19th century to America replicating in turn in the Asian miracle in terms of the rise of the sine qua non element of urbanization, globalization, development, which is the car, the automobile. French word, German invention, comes to define the American dream in the 1900s and now becomes a big part of Asia's rise. And of course, putting tremendous demands on global oil use. So when we look at where we have the concentration, it's pretty clear here. 600 cars per 1,000 people in Europe. America has a car for everyone. Asia will add a US car market in the next eight years and then add another one in the next eight years after that. So when we talk about who's going to integrate the southern regions, the last one into the globalization mix tends to be the one who replicates next. 
which is why East Asians are doing all that investment, all that integration, network building throughout Latin America and Africa. They even have a car for it. It's the uh, Indian uh, or the Tata Nano. It's an absolute piece of crap. It doesn't have any air conditioning, doesn't have any power or anything. But if you've ever been in a third world capital and seen a husband, a wife, two kids, a dog, and three chickens riding on a motorcycle, for $2,000, that is pure heaven. It does have a tendency to spontaneously combust, but <laughs> whatever. Because of that huge resource demand coming out of East Asia, we have this meme now in academic circles about resource wars. We're going to fight over resources across the planet. And this is where we get into the subject I wanted to explore based on my global crowdsourcing firm. We ran the North American Energy Export Boom simulation three years ago to explore this very topic. And some of the key findings from that were you're going to see refined products heading uh, to Africa in large numbers. I do that kind of brokering myself. Uh, the movement uh, of Western Hemisphere products into Africa, refined products, are basically what's driving a lot of that shift from uh, net importer refined to net exporter of refined that occurred about five, six years ago. You're seeing the cleaner coal already head to East Asia, the gas in terms of the LNG, and then you're going to see cheap energy resurrect some of the economic integration dynamics with the free trade of the Americas Agreement. Then, because of the water requirements involved with fracking, uh, I'm predicting, personally, the end of biofuels in the United States, which is a huge and wasteful use of uh, the most important resource we have, which is arable land. So looking at that simulation, we came up with four futures in terms of North America's energy export boom, master narratives. We display them on an XY axis. The vertical question, sort of how does it go in the United States? North America gets it right in terms of the rules, in terms of doing it in an environmentally sustainable way, or America, North America gets it wrong. There's too much of a backlash, there's too many mistakes. Then does the rest of the world successfully copy it or seek to sabotage it for their own means? The Saudis keep the price of oil quite low right now, not just to beggar the Russians in relation to Syria, not just to beggar the Iranians, who they detest, but also to destroy the fracking revolution in the United States. So the one where North America gets it wrong and the rest of the world fights, ignores, sabotages, that one we dubbed what the frack. We talked about a European crash leading to not much effort on their side. You could almost argue that that's happened already. Uh, more attention paid to the earthquake problems, uh, the not in my backyards going bananas as we called it, don't build anything near, don't build anything near anything, don't build anywhere near anything, I think that's the acronym. We talked about competitors using what they call lawfare, basically coming into the legal systems in North America to try to sabotage the entire process. We could find out that the shale, in terms of its, uh, uh, what we can take out of the ground, proves shallow. And then there's the uh, so-called red queen dynamic where no matter how fast you're going on this process, you never get ahead of the curve. I think that's been largely disproved over the last five years. In terms of America getting it wrong, but the rest of the world jumping ahead, we called that gas is always greener on the other side of the fence. Here we talked about short-term regulations creating short-term solutions in the United States, kind of choking off the development of the fracking industry. Uh, a lot more attention paid to the uh, trade-off between GHG, uh, um, what do they call those again? Greenhouse, Greenhouse gases and carbon. Uh, we talk about the Canadians uh, turning away from the United States, piping up in the direction of their west coast, more towards Asia, a growing competition for shale, uh, Asia doing whatever it has at extreme water costs to pull it off, and then the rise of a new form of national energy companies based on natural gas as opposed to Knox, national oil companies. A better perspective we called the fit of peaks. Uh, North America succeeds, but the rest of the world can't keep pace. Here we talked about uh, refineries happening uh, uh, in terms of uh, experiments on reservation lands within North America. We talked about Mexico taking the lead on this with less of a concern for environmental damage. Energy partnerships for the rest of the Americas 
OPEC seeks to disrupt in terms of keeping oil prices low, but can't uh, on a systemic level. Uh, and then you see the geopolitical shift. Carter Doctrine said we'd do whatever it took to keep the Persian Gulf open. Maybe then we start thinking more in terms of a revivification of the Monroe Doctrine, keeping the Western Hemisphere more for America. And then the best scenario, America gets it right, the rest of the world gets it right. We call that one now we're cooking with gas, which is the actual marketing slogan when they started marketing natural gas ovens in the late 1800s in America to get people off wood burning stoves. We talk about a US Canadian virtuous uh, spiral. King coal really gets div uh, diverted to uh, exports to Asia. Uh, shale gas moves in the direction of syn gas and ultimately to gasoline. All sorts of new energy realities create a rust belt reborn, the manufacturing revivification that people have been talking about. Not too sure that's going to appear. But then also playing again to an embedded strategy of, of advantageous resources in North America. It's not just the food, it's not just the water, ultimately it's the energy security. So those four scenarios. How that affects the geopolitical energy landscape, my quick rendering here. I like to point out energy flows around the planet. The US has always been its number one source of energy, arguably will be for the long foreseeable future. The number two source to our benefit has been north and south. Number three source, Chavez talked a really big game, sold to America because it was the cheapest in terms of transportation costs. Now we got Brazil coming online with the pre-salt deposits off the coast. Fourth biggest source of energy for the United States, West Africa, it's been Nigeria. It's gonna move into uh, Ghana and ultimately Gabon, Angola to a certain extent. And then number five source, to people's surprise, the Persian Gulf which accounts for about two, maybe 3% of US energy use overall. Which means you take the Persian Gulf out of the equation, the United States is hardly affected. Of course, the rest of the world would be dramatically damaged. And on that basis, our economy would be damaged. This picture is true before the revolution in fracking. Cited earlier today, just as recently as 2005, 60% of our oil was imported. Now it's much less. And we're estimating that you're gonna be a net exporter of crude uh, uh, oil even uh, in the mid to, uh, 20s. So why that matters, the evolution of fuel mix. We look at Europe versus the United States versus China. You can see everybody was on coal. The United States switches over to uh, oil right around the Second World War. That's when we start to become interested in the Persian Gulf. The origins of the US-Saudi relationship begin there under FDR. Then look what happens when Europe also becomes oil dominated. That's when, starting with the uh, 67 war, the centrality of the Persian Gulf and US military crisis response patterns starts to accumulate. So that by the 1980s, when you add up all the crisis response days by US military forces, about 75 to 80% are in that part of the world, the Persian Gulf. And it's been even more concentrated since. But look what happens. The United States becomes a natural gas-centric economy quite soon, years. Europe becomes renewable energy led. And the Chinese depressing their coal, obviously heading towards more oil and natural gas. And here's the reality that's uncomfortable with this picture. The centrality of the Persian Gulf, it's basically under new management. And the problem here is the Chinese, the Indians, the South Koreans, the Japanese aren't in a position, are uncomfortable with the reality that they are now the big providers extra-regionally of security and stability in the Persian Gulf as the United States becomes less and less motivated to take on that role. So here's the big game changer in the system. All the ones who export, no changes. All the ones who import, big change. Asia wants a lot more. The one part of the world that goes from net importer to exporter is North America where the world's military superpower resides. So where does all that energy go? It goes to East Asia. Europe draws from traditional. Russia is the big provider of nuclear technology that was mentioned. The good news, well, that growth has been dramatic. It's outside of OECD, but by and large, we're gonna see it peak over the next 10 to 15, 20 years. So it won't be that bad. 
But it's clear that Asia is the new global demand center, and it just so happens, here's the great miracle of the fracking revolution, and that's why the question of whether it successfully is exported is a huge one. The two biggest consumers in the world of energy happen to have the most shale gas reserves. Much harder to access geologically, infrastructure-wise, in China, because it's deeper and it's way out of the way. And there aren't water resources there. But when you look at that pattern, there's your Pacific century in many ways. Two-thirds of global shale reserves. So as the world moves towards that gas dominated, here comes coal down, there comes oil dropping dramatically. We become gas-centric on a planetary basis. There's your real basis for a trans-Pacific partnership. Is shifting globally towards natural gas. So last slide here, I think. Talking about the basic rules of the system in terms of power politics, the spheres of influence, in my mind, are basically set. Europe has gone about as far east as it can, bumping into the Russians. They're going to end up having a Mediterranean Union because the problems here, as we're seeing with the refugee migrant crisis right now, are so vast. They either have to own the Mediterranean in a positive sense, or the Mediterranean owns them in the security sense. The Russians will continue to dominate Russia. Why? Nobody really wants it other than the Russians. The Indians are surprisingly spanning in their perspective. They have a lot of influence, unappreciated throughout the Persian Gulf, and are highly influential in Southeast Asia. Then we have Americans in the Western Hemisphere impinging upon the entire Pacific Rim. And one thing I'll note, people are surprised by the opening to Cuba recently. You shouldn't be. Venezuela can no longer fund Cuba because of the drop in oil prices. So all the money, all the support that Chavez showered upon the Cubans, that disappears. Now all of a sudden, the Cubans are much more interested in opening up to the United States. That's because of the fracking revolution, direct consequence. China owns the rest of the planet, a lot of it having to do with Africa. People look at these two flashpoints, they see the future of Cold Wars. I tell you, there won't be a Cold War between the United States, India, and China over Southeast Asia so much because as the Chinese age demographically and as Southeast Asia enjoys a huge demographic dividend unfolding right now, guess where all those low-end manufacturing jobs got to go out of China? They're already moving into Southeast Asia. But with Putin, there are some concerns about what's going to happen. I'll tell you, Europe can buy from others. And as they do, Russia's going to have one choice. As the world's biggest exporter of natural resources, they're going to have to turn to the world's biggest importer of natural resources, which means Russia sells a lot more to China for much cheaper prices than it would get from the West. So this is not an empowering process for the Russians. This is a further beggaring of them in the uh, global po political system. The one dyad I, turn, I tend to concentrate on in terms of uh, potential for conflict is the Indians and the Chinese for a variety of reasons, competing overseas resource dependencies, expanding militaries. They plus the United States will be the three military uh, giants of the 2030 time frame. There's the Indian Ocean, which the Indians like to remind the Chinese is called the Indian Ocean. There's Afghanistan and Pakistan, a very troubled place that they both border. There's Southeast Asia, where they vie for political influence. There's Tibet, the headwaters for all the major riverine systems of East Asia, very important to both countries. And these guys actually fought a war over a disputed boundary that they dispute very hotly right to this day. But looking at that first point, overseas resource dependencies, here's where you start to see the worm turns in terms of who depends on the Persian Gulf. These are export destinations from Iran. Red represents East Asia. Biggest buyers of Iranian oil, China, India, South Korea, Japan. The United States is down there, tiny sliver. Iran's important because they have a lot of natural gas reserves. America recently becomes the biggest natural gas producer in the world. Shift it to Saudi Arabia. Biggest buyers, China, Japan, South Korea, India, again. Where's the United States? Tiny, tiny. Now the United States is the biggest oil producer in the world. And then we go back and look at Iraq, which was allegedly oil, you know, American blood, American oil, when in reality it was always going to be American blood for East Asian oil, which is why we should have turned the reconstruction to Iraq over to the Chinese from the start, because they were most motivated. 
Again, India, South Korea, China, Japan, the top four dependence on Iraqi oil. I'm going to end on that point. Uh, I'll talk about this at the panel later on about how the Middle East falls out. Uh, spoiler alert, it's going to be scary in terms of nukes. I'll be happy to take questions. We have about five minutes. Certainly, I've offended someone. <laughs> you had a slide showing grain exports, and you had it labeled um, the former Soviet Union countries. It would be interesting to see how that dynamic would change if you pulled out Ukraine, uh, Lithuania, in terms of then what Russia's left with. Um, Ukraine, it's, it's Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Russia. It's the Black Sea region. So, yeah, Ukraine is incredibly important for that reason. Um, basically, what the Russians have done with the Ukraine is the same thing they did with uh, Georgia. They do this throughout Russian history. They take hostages. Uh, think back to Georgia 2008. They grabbed two chunks, Russian majorities. They just grabbed them and they hold them hostage. And that's why Georgia does not join NATO at that point. Ukraine gets close with that uh, kind of soft coup, the electoral victory. They come in, they grab the Crimea. We forget they grabbed uh, the Transdenistra, when Moldova broke off from the Soviet Union, so they have a chunk on the eastern, or excuse me, westernmost coast of the Ukraine. Now they have Crimea. Now they're grabbing the eastern chunk. My prediction is they're going to grab the entire uh, Black Sea coast of the Ukraine to make sure that exact thing does not happen. Meanwhile, we got all of Eastern Europe and NATO. I think it was a pretty good trade. It's sad for the Ukrainians, but life has been sad for the Ukrainians for a very long time. One more quick question, and then we bring Abe back up to talk about the rest of the day. All right, so it was a pretty fascinating and wonderfully um, upsetting discussion we just had. <laughs> uh, my question relates to how food security, you were talking about global geopolitics, energy demand, movement of water and natural resources, and, and ultimately a fair amount of population growth and food security issues. In your game play and your game theory, not only are the, the four grains important, but productivity of the oceans as well. Absolutely. As a major player, especially as most of the population growth is within 50 miles of a coastline. Yeah. So how does that change where you've got acidification and reduction of productivity? You're going to see it um, virtualized in terms of aquaculture, increasingly uh, shoreline based where they're going to create things just inside the shoreline and then grow um, food that way. You know, the farm-fed salmon and all that. The Asians lead on that. They're pursuing it very aggressively because they eat a lot of fish. I think that's ultimately going to be the answer for whatever shortfall we continue to experience in terms of acidification and then the usual problems of overfishing. But again, those aquaculture processes are pretty much grain dependent, so we're back on soil and water. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's, uh, you know, that's why biofuels is a complete non-starter on any sort of logic. It's a 1 to 1 1.5 yeah. fuel ratio. Very different from sugar in Brazil, which goes 1 to 9.5. Uh, it just doesn't make any sort of sense. Uh, the real dangers, and it's one of the things the rest of the world could, should honestly be very concerned about. And I predict it's, you know, we're heading to a progressive era just like we tend to have after economic expansions, and we just had a doozy of a 30-year one. You tend to have inequality result from that. You tend to get a lot of populism that's happening all over the world, China, India, the United States, Tea Party, whatnot. Um, the trust busting that we went through under TR, McKinley, and, and Taft, I think the prime target for that, besides IT, besides Big Pharma, which we've already seen busted up a little bit over AIDS drugs, is going to be big food. There are four or five companies in America that control the seeds and the vast bulk of our diet. They control it on a global scale, Monsanto, Archer Daniel Midlands and whatnot. And the fact that they've made us amazingly overweight in 25 years by, get, by, by encouraging the subsidization, I can't say it, subsidization. <laughs> I didn't live in Washington long enough to learn that one. Um, they don't subsidize fruits and vegetables. They subsidize 
corn like crazy. So we're all eating way too much corn fructose. So that diet's being exported to Asia. The Asians are growing fat at a real high rate. The Europeans are already fatter than America. The huge you know, um, medical uh, uh, consequences of that, you know, the Chinese are just not going to be able to afford it. Um, and they joke about the number one export of America being diabetes. That was a cute one on Saturday Night Live. Um, that is going to create blowback, I think. And we're going to see a real attacking of the big players in that system. It's a very closed system. And it's very incestuous between the head players in those major companies and the positions they hold in the Department of Agriculture. I think that if I was East Asia, I'd be agitating for that a lot. I think it's an untold story uh, that it's got to change because we can't get fatter. It's just not going to work. Thank you.